1 Samuel. Do you have it? Or flip your phone over there, however you want to look at it. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm really excited about today. Um, I have learned that much of life is how you do things. Um, it really is. Uh, you, some people can view life as this is the worst year ever known to me. Or some people can look at it and go, this has been a very challenging time, but we will succeed in our time. And it's all perspective. It really is. I'm convinced that the Apostle Paul spent so much time about our thinking and our mind for a reason. Because we live in this earth, and everything that we encounter in the physical realm is going to happen in the physical realm, but how we view it, perceive it, is huge. And so um, I'm just convinced of that. And so... As we go through this time, I really feel like this morning we need to revisit, revisit the vision of what the river is called to do, who we are, what we're called to be, what God has created us to do. And uh, as I was thinking about this, I got really excited because, as Laura said, uh, this is supposed to be a year of double and restoration. And many people up to this point have not experienced restoration, have not experienced restoration even in finances, relationships, or whatever. It's almost the opposite to be be the truth. We've been totally isolated, distant, and all these different things. And it seems as though that we're experiencing everything opposite of restoration. Um, there have been some that have experienced restoration during this time. So it's amazing. How can someone live in the same environment that we're all living in, but yet experience restoration in their own lives? I'm convinced it's because they've been believing and believing and believing that it's going to happen in the midst of all this chaos. So uh, I wanted to revisit really the vision of this church and what we've been called to do. Uh, I know people have said that church is going to change um, during these times, and it has. I'm not going to argue that. It has changed. A lot of people have not come because they are, they're fearful. And you know what? I get that, and I totally understand that. And so we're all about having people to come that want to come and feel comfortable, but we're also all about people that want to watch from online, too, as well. And so, uh, I get it. There's a lot of fear going on, and we talk exhaustively about that. But I feel as though that we've got to set our mind <coughs> on the vision and begin to just be steadfast and go towards the vision that God has called us to be and to do. In the midst of all the chaos, we've got to look at the vision and go forth and just continue to focus on it. Uh, I'm also convinced if you focus on something long enough, hard enough, that it'll come about. Amen. If you focus on 25 different things, it's going to be hard to bring any of those to completion. But if you focus on one, then it's going to come to completion, not just eventually, but it will come expeditely. I mean, it'll be fast. So that's what I want to focus on this morning. So uh, do you have your Bibles or your phone to look something up? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 22. First Samuel, first Samuel chapter 22. As I was recalling this morning, as I was praying and, and saying, God, oh, it's early in the morning. I'm tired. I need a pep. I need something to get you going. And we just had a conversation with one another. How do you know that the Lord speaks to you and can speak to you today? You know that? How do you know that he doesn't just speak to you on a Sunday morning between the hours of 10 and 12? He can speak to you wherever you are. How do you know he can speak to you on, on a boat while you're fishing? While you're on the golf course hitting a little light pimple ball. How many know that he can speak to you out in a bar playing country music and dancing right along with you? He can speak to you anywhere. How do I know that? Because the Bible says in Colossians that he is in all things. He's all things. He holds all things together. So he's not just limited to a religious service. And so this morning as I was speaking to him, God, I need something from you. And he said, well, I'm going to show you the vision I gave you years and years and years ago. And you need to come to the realization that I'm restoring that vision to you now. And all that, that's pretty stinking awesome. That'll get your blood pumping. That'll get your juices flowing in the morning. And so that's what I'm going to do. We had this verse that I'm going to read in just a second. We had an old pulpit. It was an old one. One of the very first ones I think we ever had. And this pulpit was also Bill Hartung, Bill Fair. Many of y'all know Bill. He's, he passed away and he's with the Lord now. Bill could do amazing things with wood and build things. And he built this little pulpit, and, and, and we had it forever. And he engraved on the pulpit itself, so every time that I would go up to it and I would see it, 
I would see this verse. And, and, and that's the verse we're going to read because this is who we are. This is who God called us to be. As the, the fellowship and the assembly of the River Church, this is our purpose. And I want to speak to you today. And I want you to all look at me. Look at me real closely and listen to what I'm about to say. We are going to be laser focused on this. And it shall be accomplished. And we will see it come to completion sooner rather than later. Amen. We may have been out of focus because we may have been focused on a lot of different things. But we're going to be focused on this vision. And everything we do at the river is going to be centered around this vision. Okay? Are y'all ready to be reminded? Mm -hmm. Some of y'all that are here today, this will be the first time you've heard this. So you're going to be inspired. You're going to be encouraged. And you're going to be like, man, I want to be a part of that. And that's what we hope. You that are watching, same thing. There will come a day, those of you that are watching, there will come a day when it will be safe and everybody will be comfortable to go back into fellowship together again. Amen. And I want you to know that you're watching. Here at the river, we are going to be ready for that. The facilities that we have dreamed and using in our vision are going to be completed for that. Everything's going to be ready to go. So when you come back, you're going to be able to step right in with everyone else that's here going towards this vision, laser focus. Amen? Amen. All right. So many of you all know that have heard me preach for any length of time, you hung out with me, you know that I have fans, if you will, that I love to read about people in the Bible. Number one is the Apostle Paul. He's my all-time favorite. You, know, you don't like Jesus? I hear people saying that. Well, I love Jesus. But I can relate to Paul. I can relate to Peter and these guys. And so the Apostle Paul is like one of my all-time favorites because he was a wall breaker. He broke down barriers. Amen. I mean, we have people out there today thinking they're breaking barriers down. The Apostle Paul was breaking down race barriers. He was breaking sex barriers. I mean, you name it, he was busting them down. In the first and second century, you look at all of his work that extended to those centuries, it's amazing. So I'm a big fan of Paul. Another person I'm a big fan of is David. I'm a real big fan of King David. I'm a fan of him before he was a king. I'm a fan of him when he was a king. And you know why I'm a fan of David? Because it's like looking in the mirror when you look at his life. David had so many opportunities. He had the anointing speaking, they're spoken over him. His destiny was set out before him, and he found ways to screw it up. I can relate to that. Amen? And so I'm a big fan of David. And so I'm going to read this verse, and then we're going to kind of expand on this. It's 1 Samuel chapter 22, and it's verse 2. And it says, And everyone, everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became their captain over them. Now, there were about 400 men with him. That was the verse that Bill carved in wood on the pulpit. Every time I would see it, I would see that and look at it. And, and here's why this is so powerful. How many of you ever have heard of David's mighty men? If you've heard of David's mighty men, raise your hand and keep them up. Did you know? Did you know this? This is a fact that David and his men were the only men that killed giants. You know the story, right, about David and Goliath. But do you know the other stories about the other giants that were killed by the hands of David's mighty men? So watch this. This is, why this is so important. What did David's mighty men do? They were like the most talked about, feared group of people because of all the things that they did and all they accomplished and conquered. I mean, if you go back and you read about what David did and what his mighty men did, people could talk for hours about all the things they did. And, and you know they had that famous song that they used to sing about David, right? Saul slayed his thousands, but David slayed his Right? They used to sing that. And Saul was the king at the time. Do you think he got a little jealous? Oh, yeah, he did. So much so that Saul tried to kill David, even though that he was anointed to be the king. It was something about David. 
Not only did he did he did he kill lions and bears, but he killed Goliath. He rescued a nation, put a, a nation on the map, and brought them from the pits all the way up to a status where all those in the land feared Israel and David, and he was responsible for that, which is amazing. And so I want you to really grasp the, this whole issue in this verse that's going on here. So all these mighty men that were associated with David were famous, and people looked at them as something that's great. But I want you to see how they came to David. Did they come great? No. I've often used the analogy of football because I like football. I don't know if I'll watch it this year. I don't know what's going to happen this year, right? But I like football, and I'm a big Dallas Cowboys fan. And I know, I know, I know. This year's their year. I've been saying yeah. it. I've been saying it for years and years and years. I mean, I can remember the glory days of the 90s. Yeah. Great, man. It was awesome. Yeah. Troy Aikman, this man. Oh, yeah. Michael Irving. Preaching, man. I mean, come on. Yeah. Leon and Let, all these great people. Man, those were days. And then there's been the last 15, 20 years. Right? <laughs> but this is their year, right? And so I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of football. And many people would say that probably the most successful football team in the past 10, 15 years has been the New England Patriots. Why? Because they always win. I mean, how many Super Bowl rings do, does Tom Brady have? I don't even know. Six. Six? Six. 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 I mean, I don't like the Patriots. I do not like the Patriots. I do not like green hands and hands and green eggs and ham. I don't like them. I don't like the Patriots. I love the Cowboys, but I, I respect them. They just keep winning. I respect Bill Belichick, you know he cheats. I respect <laughs> the winning and all this, right? Now, has anybody for the past 15 years been a Cleveland Browns fan? Exactly. They've been the most consistent losers for the past 15 years, right? Nobody wants them. The Cleveland Browns is where the quarterbacks go to die. I mean, it's just a fact. I mean, coaches go there to die. No one wants any part of it. They can't give their players away at this point, right? I mean, it's just the way it's been in over the past 15 years. David's men were Cleveland Browns. Nobody wanted them. They didn't have anything to offer. They were like the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. When you just read this in verse 2, it says, number one, that everyone, look at the person next to you and say, birds of a feather flock together. I mean, you attract people that you, that you are. I mean, who you are is who you're going to attract. And it was no different. So it wasn't that David got Michael Irvin, Troy Aikman, Emma Smith, and Jimmy Johnson. He did not get them. He got the worst of the worst. I, you couldn't even look. Listen to me. Look at me for real quick. This is important. You couldn't even look at these men that came to David and say, you have potential. You'd be lying. <laughs> they just didn't have anything to offer. Everyone. Do you have the picture? Everyone was in distress. Now, look this up in the Hebrew. It's interesting. When you look at that actual word, distress, in the Hebrew, it says, narrowly confined. And I thought to myself, I know folks like this. They're in distress because the vision they have is narrowly confining. There's no hope. There's no way to break out. There's no future to look for. I mean, think of this for a second. Let me ask you a quick question. You know, all this. What if next week, and I'm not speaking this into existence, by the way, into existence, but what if next week the government came out and said, we're going to close the entire state down. You cannot go anywhere. You have to be confined to everything. And we're going to keep that that way for a full year. How many of you have hope? How many believe that you'd be narrowly confined? Yeah. So think about it. I think we can all relate to what we're going through today because we feel as though that all the dreams we had have been put on hold. 
But this something else came into the picture to stop. What not you think of this? So David's men, these men that came to David, had no vision. They were narrowly confined. They had no hope. And in that, they were distressed. Have you ever been hopeless? Have you ever been without a dream, without focus, without vision? If you are, you're going to find yourself in a distressful situation because you have nothing to live for. Many people visit that place, and not only do they visit, they put up a tent, and they begin to build a house at that place, and they live in that narrowly confined place that brings about distress. That's where these men were from. That's where they lived, and that's what they were bringing with them to David. Oh, hallelujah, joy. Can you just see David? Thank you, Lord, for these great people. Woo! Right? This is awesome. Uh, right? And then the next one, watch this. It says, everyone who was in distress, narrowly confined, no vision, right? And everyone who was in debt, look that up in the Hebrew, guess what it means? Broke. Uh. <laughs> and that is what it means. Broke. Okay, thank you, God. So you brought me people without vision. They are narrowly confined, have no hope. I mean, they are the epitome of Megan and Nancy. I mean, they are the epitome of no joy. And now they're broke. Right? I mean, think about David. David, God, you called me. You've anointed me as king of Israel. We're going to have this great place. And the people you're using it to build this whole thing have no hope. And they're broke. Yay, God. Right? And I, want, and I want you to understand, don't discount the word everyone. Because they had unity. Did you know you could have <laughs> unity in distress? You can be unified in your brokenness. It's amazing. And watch this, it's important. Once you're unified in this way of thinking, then everybody else is for and out there. So if someone's speaking vision and hope and prosperity, oh no, no, they're not. They're, they're weird. They don't know any better because you become unified in your distress. Unified in debt and in brokenness. A good person next to you to say, that's a stinky place to be. <laughs> everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented. Guess what that Hebrew word means? Ready for this? Here it comes. Bitter. <laughs> the Hebrew word means bitterness. Bitter. Now are you following me with the Cleveland Brown analogy? I mean, think about this. So here's David. Saul's trying to kill him. You'll find out that the enemy hates him in the morning. He can't even join their team. Nobody wants to be around him. And then all of a sudden, these 400 men show up at his camp. And everything they have to offer is everything that he can't use and work with and that he doesn't want. People that are narrowly confined, people that are broke, and people that are bitter. Sounds like a recipe for joy. <laughs> Think about those three qualities. No vision, no hope. Narrowly confined. No money. I do anything. And just flat out bitter. Do you know the effects of bitterness? Do you know what bitterness will do? It creates a root system in you. And it begins to grow in you to such an extent that it doesn't just affect you emotionally, but it affects you physically. Bitterness is one of the most detrimental, I say, detrimental to diseases today. I don't think I'm overstating that. Because when someone's bitter, nothing is good. Nothing is looks promising. And when you are bitter and then you have 400 people with you bitter, come on. That is not an environment I want to be around at all. So I want you to listen to this. I'm going to read this again and I want you to think about narrowly confined. I want you to think about broke. And I want you to think about bitter when I read this. And everyone who was distressed and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered 
to him. That word gathered in the Hebrew means assembled. Okay? Gathered to him. So he just started a church with 400 people that were broke, narrowly confined, and bitter. It's not a good formula for church planning. They gathered to him, now watch this, and he became their captain. Literally, it means leader. He became their captain over them. Now, there were about 400 men with them. I want you to realize what David did. He took individuals, 400, 400 of them like that, and he transformed their lives into greatness. Let me ask you a question. Can you defeat the Goliath in your life by having a narrowly confined vision, being broke, and bitter. Can you? So not only did David defeat the life, but he raised up men to defeat their own giants. And these are the same ones that had no money, had no vision, and they were bitter. How does that happen? What transformation occurred to bring them out of that into people that would write and sing songs about their fame. How does that happen? Folks, listen to me. The river here in San Angelo, which is an assembly of fellowship, we were called and created to be a transformation center. That is our vision. Everything that we do is about transforming individuals to greatness. Listen to me, this is important. And it does not matter if you have anything or nothing to offer. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're bitter right now. It doesn't matter if you don't have a great vision about something. And it doesn't matter if you're broke. You can be transformed to greatness, to slay giants in your own life. Now watch this. You don't have to fit in those categories either. Maybe you're here, maybe you're watching, and maybe you do have a vision. Maybe you do have a little money to do things with. And maybe you're not better, but you're on this train. You don't have to fall in this category to be a part of this body. You can be transformed. I don't know anyone I've ever met that's perfect in everything they do. We are all on a journey being transformed from glory to glory. So the River San Angelo, grab a hold of this vision. We're going to be laser focused at this point. And this is what we're going to I'm going to share with you today. Laser focused on transforming people. Transforming. Okay, now what does that look like? You know, I remember years I was thinking about today because I was praying and I was saying, God, I remember when you gave us this vision and, and about people that would come in this contented and discontented. I remember that so clearly today. And, and I remember I was in my 20s. A long time ago, in my twenties, and I just remember just being just like passionate and just going for it and doing all these things. And I remember this morning that the Lord showed me, reminded me. He said, "Do you remember the year that I told you that I wanted you to start taking risks?" I said, "Yeah, I remember that." In my life at the time, I was one that would never take a risk. I, I was one that would just kind of go along and and do whatever. And, and I remember that one morning. He said, you remember when I told you to take risks? And he said, have you taken any risks? <laughs> I laughed because I'm like, heck yeah. It seems like for the last 15, 20 years, there's been nothing but risks. <laughs> and, and he's like, I'm proud of you. And I'm like, it, it's not comfortable. It's not fun sometimes. He's like, no, no risks. And so immediately he reminded me of that. And, and, and coupled it with the vision that we've been called to at the river. And I remember, I was reading a book back then in my 20s. I was reading a book, and when the Lord said, I want you to start taking risks, I was reading a book about taking risks in business and financial and everything. And it was like the Lord used something, another book, to confirm what he had already spoke to me. And so when I read that, after he spoke to me, I thought, I'm going to take more risks because I feel like God's leading me to take more risks, right? So 
How are we going to be a part of transforming people's lives? Number one, I believe this with all my heart. I want you to write this down. I want you to do something with it. Part of transformation, this is what we're going to be about. Knowledge will change your life. Simple. Knowledge will change your life. Now, I know some people will say, well, it's about applying knowledge. I, I, I get all that. But I didn't know anything until I began to read and study and begin to listen. And then when I gained knowledge, now the opportunities to break out of my confined narrowness was the limits. So knowledge will change your life. It will. So what we're going to do at the river is we're going to provide streams. We're going to provide knowledge to change your life. We're not going to just do that on Sunday mornings. We're going to do that with our kids. It's all about transformation. Knowledge will change your life. But what kind of knowledge will, tra will, will transform your life? Would you like to know? What was it? That, just like these men. I've come to know a lot of things in my life. And one of the things I've learned is if I don't have money, I can't do a lot of things. I mean, I hate to say that, but it's just true. Everything I've ever tried to do in life requires money. And it stinks, but that's the reality. And what I've learned over the years is God has so much in his word about gaining and increasing that I've applied and taken risk over the last 15 years to position ourselves in a place to begin to live this. And it is stunk, and it is hard, and it is really difficult at times. But the Lord reminded me this morning, I was the one that called you to do these things. You stepped out in faith, and when you step out in faith, if the result happens immediately, then everybody would do it. But you've got to go on the journey to learn a few things so that when you do succeed and you do have all this stuff that you've been praying for, that you don't throw it away like David did, like Peter did, like some of these others. Learn from our past. Learn from the history of these people. And I, and I recall this, I'm going, man, so all this has been a journey of learning things? God, I'm tired of learning. I actually said that. I'm tired of learning because it's painful. Knowledge will change your life if you're willing to be open. Open for God to put something in your spirit that may make you uncomfortable. I'm convinced of that. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to provide knowledge through God's Word and through the Holy Spirit. We're going to provide knowledge to people to set them up to transform their lives. Amen? Amen. Secondly, the second thing we're going to do. You ready for this? Real hard. First one is knowledge is going to change your life. Real simple. Second one is this. Ready? Are you ready? We're going to teach people how to love and not judge. Amen. Wow. You say, well, why do you have to teach people to do that? Because the people aren't doing it, obviously, today. We're just a great, great device in this. Because we think we're better than someone else or whatever. And we're not loving people. We judge people based on what we believe and what we think. Who made, who made us God? That's not for me. Well, but there are all these people that, that are doing things and, and they're opposite than the Bible. They're op No, they're opposite either of your political point of view or your theological basis. It doesn't mean that you're right in either one of those. The one thing I know about Jesus is he loved everybody. And the ones that he came up against were the religious people who were self-mandating all the self-righteousness. Bull junk. <laughs> he loved people. He did not judge them. He broke down barriers. He loved people. So we're going to teach people because we got to today. I wish it was just an assumption. And I wish everybody just knew how to do it. But we don't. So we're going to provide knowledge to change your life. And we're also going to teach people how to love and not judge. That's the same thing we're going to do. Right? Number three. Last one. Ready? Pretty simple. This is a transformation center. Everything we're going to do is going to provide knowledge for you to transform. Right? But the baseline of that is we're going to love and not judge. Because let me tell you, if you had one Drew Brees in this camp and 400 nobody showed up, Drew would be like, I'm out of here. Let's face it, I'm out of here. Because he looks and he judges. And I'm not, no, no, I'm not Drew, I'm just using that as an analogy. I like Drew Brees, right? 
But the fact is, when you get a bunch of people that come in that are in a bad place, those people in a better place have a tendency to judge. And that's unfortunate. Remember where you came from. Right? So we are got to teach people how to love and how to do it. Third, and I love this, and people are going to probably hate this. We should talk about that in church. We are going to teach you how to prosper. We're going to teach you how to prosper. But the person makes you go, what? We're going to teach you to prosper like John prayed. In 3 John, in 3 John chapter 1, John prayed this. I pray that you would prosper in all things that you would prosper. Thou did behind that you would prosper in your health and you would prosper in your finances. We're going to teach you how to prosper. It's a shame that the church has to teach that today. It is a shame. We have so much in here that tells us that we've been given blessings to partner in and to enjoy. So why is that so important? Because number one, if you're not in good health and don't feel good, you can't do much. And if you don't have anything, you can't help much. Well, I'm going to give you moral support. Praise God. I appreciate your heart, but sometimes we need greenbacks and not your moral support. I mean, you know, I talk to anybody, anybody that knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so the third thing, we're going to teach people how to prosper in all things in health, in finances. That is our focus, guys. We are a transformation soon. Now, I want, you, I, want to, I want to share the results of that. Can I share the results? Can I, can I tell you what that looks like? Okay. So if we begin to share knowledge that will transform your life, and we begin to teach you how to love and not judge, and we teach you how to prosper on things, once you and I start walking in that, people will take notice. Can I ask you one little question to be honest? Can you be honest? How many of you would say People in this world with the most money, people will listen to. Raise your hand. Why? Do they listen to stuff that's not even business oriented? Do they listen to stuff about political views and about you know spiritual things? Why? Celebrity status, but why? Why do they? Why do they have the ears of people? Because they can make things happen. Because they are proven to be successful, and people will listen to people that have proved to be successful in whatever area, right? And it, and they'll listen to things that they're not even experts about because they've proven to be successful in whatever. I mean, it's mind blowing to me, but that that is that's the fact. So let me ask you, by the end of David's reign, no, not by the end, but let's say at the height and the peak of his fame with him and his mighty men, did people listen to him and his men? Yes. yes. Dang right, they did. Because their success, their success that they had opened up people to look at them as successful and people want to learn from folks like that. Well, if you want to kill giants, you've got to hang around giants. Couldn't say it better myself. Right, Jair? No. If you want to kill giants, you gotta hang around a giant killer. <laughs> There's four giants, I guess, that were killed in the Bible, if I remember maybe off those numbers, and all of them came from David or his men. You wanna hang you wanna kill giants, hang out a giant killer. Well, great. And so that's what transformation is gonna do. Once we begin to walk in those three things, we're gonna have people listen to us because we've succeeded. In different areas. Now watch this. I want y'all to look at me real closely, please. This is so important. I cannot stress it enough. The success is not limited to Sunday morning. That's not what we're after here. Do we want to fill this place up? Absolutely. Why? Because we want to see people transform. But the results of transformation are going to infect other circles of people influence and ultimately affect the world. That's the goal here. You know, for years, you, you get frustrated because it seems like there's no activity, there's no vision, there's no hope. I get that. And a lot of that is for me, is the blame on that. Because I get so, so many 
many things that you got to do. And when you get so many things you got to do, you're just not really focused enough to bring about the result you need to do. And so this morning, the Lord said, oh, this is all I want you to focus on. This right here, when it's concerning the river in your life, this is what I want you to focus on. You are to be a leader of people that will be transformed. That's what you're called to do. Okay, that's a pretty simple thing. Sounds good. Provide knowledge. Teach people to love and to judge. And teach people how to prosper in wholeness, health, as well as financial. And the Lord responds to this. When you do that, people will listen to you in all areas of your life. Because you've proven to them just like the Bill Gates and the others that are successful. People will listen to them because they've been successful. Does that make sense? Is that too simplistic? No. The River of San Angelo has been called to be a transformation center. Please hide that in your heart. We are a transformation center. We're, we're not a lake that's stagnant and isolated. We're a river that flows. And it's about a transformation. When people's lives are transformed, they're not isolated and sane, but they're out and they're going and building new ventures and new things to include other people. I see it so clearly now. Where I, I really, it was kind of muddy in the years past, but I see it so clearly. We are a transformation center. Right? And so that little building out back, it's going to be finished. It's going to be finished so that when everyone's coming back, everything's going to be ready to go. Yeah. Is a transformation center. We need young people to begin to understand concepts of what? How to, the knowledge is a good thing. And that to listen and to learn and to, is a good thing. And not only that, but they need to come to the realization. I think the younger people of this generation have become better at loving and not judging than we have. That's right. Maybe we need to have them come teach us. Yeah. Maybe we can do that. But then the third, they need to understand that it's okay to prosper in health and prosper financially. It's not a dirty word to prosper financially. I wish you could see the amount of money people that make tons of money give to different charities and different places. And the only reason they're able to do that is because they prosper. It's not a dirty word. I promise you it's not a dirty word. Okay? So this is everything we're doing in the coming weeks. Okay? To finish in this building. Getting everything ready that we're doing is for those three things. To transform people. That's what we're going to be doing. All right? So if you come to me and you, you, come to me and you say, hey, I have this idea. Okay? Right? Hey, I have this idea. I want to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to be. Well, is it, is it going to transform people? Is it going to provide knowledge? Is it going to provide a, a loving, not judging? Is it going to provide the idea of prosperity? Yes. Okay. Then we're going to support you in doing that. No, but I want you to do that. No. No. I'm not going to do your vision for you. I'm going to do the vision God's called me to do. But I'm going to help you. And we're going to come alongside and we're going to help you do this. Right? And if you come in, hey, I've got this great idea, and we're, we're going to do this. Is it about transforming people? No, no. It, it, it's about growing our numbers. Well, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that. So that's not motivation. It's about transforming people. Amen? Can you close your eyes? If you're here, go and look around. If you're here today, and you would say, I understand that vision, just raise your hand. And be honest, please, just be honest. If you don't, that's okay. That helps me a little bit. So there are people here that understand that vision, and there are some that don't. So that helps me understand I, I need to go back, and I need to really hone some of this in to communicate it better. Okay? I appreciate your honesty. With your eyes closed, if you're here today and you go, okay, I want to be a part of this vision. I want to be a part of the vision of the river. Just raise your hand. Just one more hand. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. All right. And you've been part of this vision of the river for a long time. Lastly, thing I want to say is this. David did not, in his own strength, produce transformation. God the Father, Jesus, and his finished work, and the power of the Holy Spirit is the one that actually brings about transformation. The body of Christ, the bride, 
So we don't need to put pressure on ourselves to include that I've got to change this individual because then it will be frustrating. We are simply the vehicle. We are the vehicle transformation. And I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to actually do this. My life will change radically than simply because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit understand this. We are a vehicle. And we're providing these opportunities in knowledge, to teach. But that's what we are. We are not the one actually doing it. Transform, transform. And I wanted to point that out. And I think it's necessary that we do. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you these three things are what we're going to be laser focused on. I mean, out of this, there's a multitude of things that are going to happen. A multitude of different things. But we're not focusing on those multitude of things. We're focusing on these three. And Lord, I thank you for just laying it out that way. So moving forward, God, when someone comes to us and asks us, does your church believe in X, Y, and Z? We're able to go back to these three things. And we're able to say, our church believes in loving people, not judging people. And that right there will solve a lot of issues. And so, Lord, I thank you that you've prescribed this for us. We embrace it, we take it, we walk in it, we thank you for it. So, Lord, as we've submitted to you today, and I thank you that this river will flow. As we partner with you. We become the vehicle for you to transform people's lives. And nothing more that I would love to see, Lord, than this building filled up with people overflowing that are transformed. That's what I want to see. Not transformed to be religious, but transformed to have a voice. In Jesus' name, everybody says, Amen. 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 Appreciate it. Y'all, if y'all are interested in what Laura had talked about, give her a, a shout on that. It would be really cool. Uh, again, that kind of goes along with the talk number three. I think it has a lot to do with it. And number one. And so, you know, we love you guys. Uh, you're going to go and you're protected by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.